and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Over the past few years, the aerospace industry, in particular civil aviation, has seen countless innovations coming to fruition and with many more on the horizon. And exactly that horizon that we're going to look at right now, 2020, as we've said before, may turn out to be a turning point, a year of return for the uh, industry. And I'm very, very happy uh, to discuss discuss that, uh, to discuss the steps in the right direction uh, with uh, Grazia Vitadini, uh, Chief Technology Officer at Airbus and here on stage live uh, in the Meistersaal. Thank you so much. And uh, remote, uh, I would hope that we are connected to Greg Hislop, uh, the Chief Engineer at Boeing, joining us from Seattle. There he is. Hi, how are you doing, sir? Grant. Um, <laughs> well, they actually quite know each other quite well, and yet let's kick off with Grazia, if you don't mind. And uh, before we actually start the conversation, I just want to say that at the end of your conversation, we're going to look to a project called Clean Sky Towards Climate Neutrality, an EU-driven um, uh, initiative with Axel Klein, but that will come in a moment. Uh, we have, we've heard that it's um, 15 years until you, your organization, your company is going to have hydrogen planes out there, not just on the tarmac, as I said earlier, but really also in the air. Um, it, is that an ambitious uh, number? Um, 15 years, sorry, from my perspective, sounds long time. It does, indeed, Connie. It is a long time, yet in our industry and seeing the extent of the ambition, um, it's, it's really a very, ambitious, a very ambitious timeline. We aim, indeed, to develop the first zero emission aircraft, commercial aircraft, by 2035. Now, this is not just an ambition or a vision. Uh, we really are aiming at very tangible and concrete roadmaps and milestones by you know, developing technology demonstrators over the next years. And we count to be able, already by the mid-2020s, to be able to um, select uh, an architecture and really focus on specific technologies to take us there in order really to take us to market uh, with such an aircraft in the next, uh, in the next decade. We did recently announce three separate uh, concepts, uh, the Zero E, to pursue our ambition. These different concepts do have a common denominator in hydrogen. Now, we really see hydrogen as the, one of the most promising technology pathways towards clean aviation. Uh, a pathway which would contribute by even more than 50%, we think, to, to achieving our ambitions. It can truly be a zero emission fuel. It is already in use in various, uh, in various sectors and with scaled production of green hydrogen and falling costs, of course, we, uh, it could become available to other, to other industries as well. It offers really an opportunity to go zero emissions, zero CO2 emissions, zero NOx emissions, uh, without forgetting that as with every other technology, such a global transition is, is really very challenging. It will require uh, political alignment, legislators and uh, uh, certification bodies will need to establish harmonized norms and rules worldwide logistically. How do you produce it? How do you transport it? How do you make it readily available worldwide? And of course, technically, we're going to have to redesign our products around that, um, that power source. Uh, which is very promising. It has three times the energy density of kerosene, but little detail, it happens to be also four times more voluminous, right? And we're referring to hydrogen in its liquid state, meaning we're going to need to bring it and keep it at minus 153 degrees Celsius. That would be minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So quite a challenge to optimize the architecture around this disruptive element um, improving the overall aircraft aerodynamics and performance. It's a huge effort. We don't underestimate it. We don't downplay it. 
And yet, we really do believe we owe it to the future generations for them to continue benefiting from aviation just like we do. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, for the survival of the future generations, because the Earth is going to survive. Uh, Greg, um, of course, uh, uh, coming from a different social context, different continent, uh, uh, okay, one global market, um, is zero emission um, an equal goal to Boeing, would you say that? And, and maybe then what strategy do you follow? And um, there was one word that I haven't heard uh, up to now in this conference, and that's solar. Um, whilst we know that there are sort of a couple of projects, really nice projects out there, uh, is it something that from a commercial point of view, uh, any of uh, the OEMs envisage? Well, I think, you know, the most important thing about uh, this problem for our industry is it's a very large problem. And I think we have to have very practical solutions that can be implemented across multiple platforms and for multiple missions. Not one, one solution is not going to be the answer for every airplane, for every range. Um, we still believe, we've been working with hydrogen fuel since 2008. We flew a hydrogen fuel cell airplane uh, 12 years ago. We flew an all uh, electric hydrogen high altitude UAV a number of years ago. And hydrogen presents some real uh, opportunities, as Grazia uh, highlighted. But we also believe having sustainable aviation fuels is still very important for long range aircraft uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so I would, I would encourage everyone to think about this problem that there is not going to be one answer. Um, there's gonna have to be multiple answers. Um, we've had looked at solar for very high altitude, uh, long endurance uh, aircraft. Uh, again, a very selective, specialized aircraft for very select and specialized missions. Um, and I think it has a place, just as we think electric and hybrid electric will have a place for smaller aircraft, maybe even regional aircraft at some point. But we also believe that for long range aircraft and long range travel, which is going to be there in the, and we want that because it's important that people connect around the world and are able to do that, but to minimize that economic effect, we're gonna need sustainable fuels. Um, so, so it's gonna require multiple technologies to address needs. I mean, there's not one airframe. If you think about how we design our aircraft, there isn't one airplane or one airframe design that does everything. There is, there's a unique airframe design for that mission that you have to perform. And similarly, as we approach this and want to reach uh, zero emissions for our aircraft, we're going to have multiple answers that will address this problem we face as an industry. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, just looking at the time that, that is left for us, uh, uh, both on stage and remote, uh, just the two of you are actually meeting uh, because there is something like an exchange, certainly on the technological level, uh, which I think for me as a passenger uh, is, is very nice, uh, the idea of it. Um, is there something like a joint development pre the actual product so that uh, despite the fact that you said there is a variation, that sort of, you know, basic technology, especially when you then talk to um, airports, when you talk to governments, uh, that you're actually sort of singing off the same uh, songbook. Well, yes, as, um, as Greg, uh, Greg aptly, aptly put it, absolutely, sustainable aviation fuels will play a significant role into decarbonizing our industry. And around this topic, back in 18, Greg, me, and other five CTOs of the industry really joined forces and uh, published a joint statement around the need of the leading um, uh, aircraft manufacturers to really cooperate to protect the planet and really to motivate also the oil and gas industry to uh, make the necessary investments in order to enable us uh, having uh, the, the, the tonnage we need by 2050 yeah. to really fuel aviation, especially long range. So that's definitely one of the topics where we need alignment within the industry because for aviation, there is no alternative. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to kerosene and synthetic kerosene. Greg, who else do you need to get on board in order to sort of make, <laughs> sorry, to use the phrase, to make it fly? 
Uh, well, and, uh, it's been great partnering with Grazia and, and our colleagues on this subject, because as I said, it's a big, hard problem, and we have to come together as an industry to solve it. We do need the fuel producers when you're talking about sustainable fuels. Um, we need to have the ec proper economic incentives for them to uh, produce enough so we can have a reasonable volume uh, to actually cross that tipping point so it'll become part of our industry. And then work with the airports and the, the, the uh, port authorities in terms of the distribution of the fuels. Um, so it's going to require that. It's going to require cooperation with our regulators and with our government authorities so that the proper incentives are in place for the industry. I would also say, I mean, I appreciate Grazia's partnership because we've worked together uh, with the pandemic to communicate to the public that the airplane really is a clean place to fly. Um, you know, we and people have to think about the whole travel experience in this, ex uh, what we're going through, but it's been great partnering with Grazia and Airbus uh, as we try and put forth protocols for cleaning the airplane and talking about the filtration and various things. So she's a good partner. Could you chip in? Uh, how do you both, and maybe sort of a, a, a one sentence answer, how do you both convince your bosses and uh, the CFOs? Right at the moment, um, you know, money is going down and you want more money for future innovation. So, how do you make them jump over uh, that gap? I, don't, I think it's a false choice thinking that we can either progress economically or ecologically. So we really need to make it clear that there is no choice, that there is one future of aviation and that is going towards the decarbonization goals to, whom, uh, to which we have jointly committed. Uh, Greg? I totally agree with Grant. It's not a it's not a hard conversation at all. We just named a chief sustainability officer for the first time for the Boeing company, and uh, it's a priority for us. So so it's it, it's a short conversation. What new kit on the block have we not talked about? And again, in one sentence, crystal crystal ball or whatever by 2050. Kit on the block in the sense of other... Like, like night, uh, uh, hydrogen is now for 2025. Maybe the next one behind there. Well, we have, we have several. As, as also Greg underlined, we need to work on many different uh, technologies concurrently and coherently, different solutions to converge to decarbonization. Another example of cooperation is, for instance, the one we have on air traffic management. So just a couple of months ago, we jointly published a white paper on the optimization of a very outdated architecture and structure, which will not, uh, is not future oriented, will not scale, and will not be able to host um, platforms with an increasing degree of autonomy. So this is definitely another fundamental parameter to consider. The last word from Greg in this conversation. I, I, Grazia answered that the way I was going to. I, I, the next thing we need to do is how we use the airplanes and uh, make sure we've got a, a system that will be secure and safe uh, when we introduce more autonomous vehicles. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for this uh, very vibrant uh, interview that we have and for the sneak preview of uh, what is going to come, what is going to be there in 2025 and beyond. Uh, that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, was uh, Grazia Vitadini and uh, Greg Heislop. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're looking to Brussels because there is something very interesting going on, maybe something, uh, Grazia, along the lines of what you have just pointed out, uh, a public-private partnership called Clean Sky, and Axel Grein has uh, a three-minute spot slot to actually take it away and explain what uh, Clean Sky Two is. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thanks a lot for the introduction, and I'm very pleased to be here today. I would like to start my short intervention, and maybe you can show the slide number one with a very brief overview of the current Clean Sky Two program. Uh, you see here. We are a 4 billion euro public-private partnership between the European Union, the public side, and the European aviation industry, the private side. Uh, you can see here that we have set clear environmental objectives at the beginning of the program. So minus 20 to 30 percent less CO2, minus 20 to 30 percent less NOx, and also minus 20 to 30 percent less noise. 
This is the best aircraft in 2014 when the program started. And we have roughly 5,000 scientists and engineers working on Clean Sky 2 projects all over Europe. So a, a huge base of engineers and researchers from various sectors, mainly aviation, but we also have interested uh, other sectors, for example, the automotive sector and companies from the automotive sector to contribute uh, uh, in, that, in that program. And you see here a bit of a breakdown of the entities which are contributing. We have uh, roughly 300 industrial players uh, in the Clean Sky program. We have roughly 340 SMEs participating. Uh, and more than 150 universities and 110 research centers. Um, it's all in all a very, very powerful ecosystem. And our benefits are roughly, they are, they are twofold. On one hand, and obviously and firstly, the technologies which are being developed, matured, and finally demonstrated, either in a ground demonstrator or sometimes even in a flight demonstrator. And secondly, I'd like to highlight as well this um, important network of, of engineers and scientists from all over Europe. Looking now at the second slide, please. Um, we, are, we are currently approaching uh, the two-third point of the existence of uh, Clean Sky, and we are seeing some great results. Um, but however, those results will be not sufficient to meet the new and highly ambitious European real targets. Uh, when you speak about climate neutrality, Clean Sky 2 will be not sufficient. The European aeronautical sector and the community uh, has sat together uh, over the last months um, and have identified uh, the potential of three main change drivers, as you can see them here, to achieve the overall target. Uh, the first one, reduction of fuel burn, and by that CO2 emission, to contribute up to 50% of the target. The second batch, uh, the improvement of air traffic management and operations uh, to bring around 10%. Uh, and finally, the third change driver, the introduction of new fuels, uh, like, for example, hydrogen, which was mentioned already before, with a potential of roughly 40%. So three main levels in order to achieve those targets. And if, if you count backwards, and I think that's what we need to do, uh, we need to put ourselves into 2050. And if you want to be climate neutral by 2050, you need to put those aircraft the latest into service beginning of the 2030s. And Grazia mentioned just before 2035. Um, and we need to have the time to retire the older and less environmentally friendly aircraft before the year 2050. So it's vital to uh, develop the technologies which are necessary in the coming years. And the coming years are the years between now and end of this decade in order to make sure that the aircraft starting in the 2030s will include those technologies uh, which can be developed in the coming years. Quickly now highlighting the most relevant focus areas um, we will uh, uh, focus on in the uh, coming decade. Uh, firstly, hybrid electric, respectively full electric aircraft architectures, um, benefiting, for example, from, a, from advanced fuel cell technologies uh, to generate propulsion energy on board of aircraft. Second focus area, uh, technologies enabling hybrid powered aircraft. Um, also, that has been mentioned before, a very promising uh, um, technology either by fuel cells uh, or also about burning hydrogen directly in gas turbines. And last but not least, the third uh, topic uh, matter here, the third focus area, ultra-efficient aircraft architectures, uh, focusing on lighter structures, enhanced systems and aerodynamics, and radically optimized aircraft configurations as you can see them here. All in all, a highly ambitious vision of climate neutrality by 2050, but also a very concrete action plan on how to achieve it. Thank you very much, Axel, to sort of take us uh, through the numbers uh, and through the estimates for the future. Now, um, looking at the Green Deal, um, the, the, the promise uh, of the European Union uh, to be completely climate neutral by 2050. Um, the stepping point, of course, being uh, 2030 with a 55% reduction of all carbon emissions. Um, do you, and I think this, this time I'm allowed to use the word believe, that we can actually hit that target in 2050? Yeah, actually, I do. Indeed, I do believe uh, that this is possible, uh, but it requires quite some change in thinking and in doing. Um, 
And I think first and foremost, it's a change in thinking. Uh, we need to develop revolutionary technologies going beyond the evolution uh, and, and, and pushing the envelope further than what we have been doing in the past. And, and we can't wait. Um, those gains need to come uh, from developments, technology developments within the coming decade. Uh, so we don't have time after 2030. So the technologies need to be developed in the coming decade. Furthermore, technologies and sustainable uh, low preferably zero carbon fuels uh, need to go hand in hand. Um, there is no either technology or sustainable aviation fuels. We need non-drop-in fuels uh, like, for example, liquid hydrogen, uh, and they are no longer out of question for the next clean sheet aircraft. Another element I mentioned already before, optimized flight routings. Uh, I think we can't accept anymore that aircraft take detours uh, as they are doing it today. Uh, mainly due to political unwillingness to resolve issues uh, like in the discussion around the single European sky. I've just been given one more, Axel, uh, minute uh, for, for our chat. And, and with that, uh, when we look at your second charge, which, uh, chart, which was on worldwide CO2 reduction, um, we've, we've had, of course, uh, the Americans and the Europeans uh, in the conversation earlier. Um, in order to achieve those numbers, in order to achieve those estimates, you must have looked at the exploding uh, market uh, in China and in Asia. How do we get them into that kind of conversation uh, of the global needs? I know that you're based in Brussels and that that's not your speciality, but it's still um, uh, a very relevant question. Yeah, in, indeed, it's a very relevant question. I believe aviation is, is, is a global uh, topic. We do not uh, develop technologies only in Europe. Uh, we do not uh, develop technologies in, in Asia or in the US. Uh, when you look at our research centers, when you look at the universities, when you look at the industry, um, those people are connected, those people are working together. And I think uh, there is no differentiation uh, in the mid to longer term between Europe, uh, Asia Pacific and the US. Uh, we will all target the same. Uh, and this is uh, also a, a request for working together in order to make it happen. Thank you very much, uh, and um, that was sort of your beneficial one minute uh, at the end. Um, with that, uh, we're going to close this particular uh, session, which was looking at technologies and, of course, uh, uh, by way of extension, which kind of fuels and uh, the future in 2050. And we're gearing up for the next panel now.